I'm waiting for them to be done. That's okay. It's okay if it's on there. I don't care. <laughs> I have seriously been looking forward to this class because this subject of apologetics is one of my passions in life. I actually wrote this course about 10 years ago and have continued to add to it. So we should be done sometime in 2024, I think. But uh, especially if you're only going to get in one every other month. You're supposed to be the first and the third Sundays of the month. And we discovered after starting, scheduling to start today, that the third Sunday this month is Father's Day. So we're not going to do that. So I decided, well, I'll just, we'll just move it to the next one. We'll do the first Sunday and the last Sunday this month and then pick up. And then Kathy frowned at me and I go, oh, yeah, we have a zone pastor's lunch on that one. So we're not doing that either. So actually, the next time after today that we're going to do this will be the third Sunday in July. Is that right? Third Sunday in July. <laughs> so take good notes so you remember Can what we. we... Down? I'm going to be down on no, sorry. <laughs> You've already been on vacation. Know, Just got back from the Holy Land. Yeah. Sorry. Also, I just want to say a big thank you to George. This is something I've really been wanting my kids to get to learn. It was a pivotal time in my high school years to learn about apologetics. And I was all of a sudden doubting if God was real, the Bible was real. So I just want to say thank you for taking my pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. Yes, George. Did you guys see the promotional videos that, that uh, Courtney and the kids made? Yeah. Oh, you check them out. They're on, what are they on the churches? Where's Kathy? They're on the churches? Mission family. Facebook. Mission family group. Family group. Face. Too many things. Anyway, anyway, they came and came over to the house and, and uh, Glory did the filming for us and the boys and, and, and Courtney and I did some just some exchange about you know what we're talking about and why it's so beneficial to do this. It says in my notes right at the top of the page, this is the toughest class for me. The reason being there's so many things I want to say first. So many things that are groundwork uh, status that I want to be able to say first and, and you, you just can't say everything first. But we're going to establish some ground rules to begin with. This is primarily a lecture format, but there will be plenty of time for questions and answers. If you ask a question that regarding something that I'm going to cover later in the study, I'll tell you that and say we'll talk about that then. I'm not going to jump ahead and get it all confused. Confused me anyway, even if it doesn't you. Plenty of time for questions and answers. There is no time at all for arguing. You may voice your opinion. This one always gets me in trouble jam, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you choose not to agree with me, I can't be held responsible for your ignorance. And if you choose not to agree with me, just thank God you live in America where you can be wrong if you want to. But we're going to have fun. We know you Your opinions are accepted, just no arguing. I was telling the boys the other day, we will not be dealing with ridiculous questions like, can God make a rock too big to pick up? This is a question I've entertained on a number of occasions. If God can do anything, can he make a rock too big to pick up? You need to understand this from the very beginning. God cannot do anything. He can only do that which is possible within the confines that he has set for himself. He's, he's put himself, given himself parameters. I remember talking to somebody a number of years ago and they said, well, you're putting God in the box. I said, I didn't put him in there. He put himself in it. When he says, if you do this, then I'll do that. I have every right to expect that result if I do what he said. I love the if-then passages in Scripture. If you do this, then I'll do this. Takes all the guesswork out of it for me. If you do this, then I'll do this. So if this isn't happening, then I'm obviously not doing this. So God has established boundaries and parameters for himself. And within those parameters, within those boundaries, he can do anything. 
outside of him. He's chosen not to. Communication is so vitally important in every area of life and no place, in my opinion, more than when we deal with these kind of subjects. I heard a story years ago about a couple that, that met when they were 19. They shared the same birthday. On their 20th birthday, they got married. So now they share the same birthday, and their birthday is also their anniversary. Forty years have passed. They've now been married 40 years. They're both 60 years old. They decide to take a trip to the South Pacific, walking along the beautiful beach one day, and the waves lapping in the background, the sun shining, stumbles on a bottle, kicks a bottle, picks it up and rubs it, and the genie comes out. The genie says, I will grant you each one wish. The woman, without hesitation, says, I know what I want. I want a ring bigger than the Star of India, which is the largest diamond in the world. She said, I want my ring to make Elizabeth Taylor's look like a trinket. Poof, just like that. She's got this monster diamond ring on her finger. The man decides to take a little bit of time to think through this a little bit. Finally, he says, you know, I've always wanted to have a wife 20 years younger than I am. And poof, just like that, he was 80 years old. <laughs> Sometimes you think you're communicating and you're not. So it's very, very important that we do our very best to communicate clearly what we want to say. Anyone who is married, a few of us in here, know that it's a cross cultural and interlinguistic experience. Cross-cultural and interlinguistic. I'm from California. Jan's from Texas. The age difference is obvious. The fact that we ever understand each other is nothing short of a miracle. That's life. And it's not just your life in the marriage relationship, it's your life out and abroad, here, out in the workplace. Not everyone is going to see things <clears throat> the same way you do. So it's important that we learn to communicate clearly. Dr. Mark Rutland, who is the former president of Southeastern University, and, and he went to uh, o ORU, took over that school, turned that place around. We were having coffee in his office one day back in... in uh, Florida. We we're talking about the importance of communication. He says communication, successful communication, he has as a student of linguistics and, and communication his entire life. Man speaks seven languages. He's crazy smart. But he said he has reduced successful communication to four things. Number one, you have to have the right message to the right people at the right time in the right way. You have to have all four of those things in existence at the same time. Otherwise, the whole experience goes south in a hurry. The right message to the right people, the right time, in the right way. Well, I got the right message because this is one the Holy Spirit has said uh, that I'm supposed to do. I know I got the right people because you're the ones that are here. Showed up for it. <laughs> I know it's the right time because, yep, it's quarter to two. We're supposed to be doing this right now. So the only remaining variable then is can I do this in the right way? So you will understand. So I've got a little test I like to do. I'm going to need your help for a minute. I need you to stand with me just for a second. Okay. I want you to take your thumb and your forefinger, hold them together like that, up in the air. Okay, now put that right there on your chin. And for those of you that missed, the chin's the pointy thing on the end of your face. <laughs> But now I know I have my work cut out for me, so go ahead and have a seat. <laughs> I get them every time. And just for what it's worth, the person that showed it to me got me too. So, Yeah. We're going to go over a, a syllabus for the class. And this young lady right here is going to pass them out for me. If you'll give one of those to each person. We'll go over this real quickly.
And if you are watching this on Facebook, I can't give you one, but we are going to go through it line by line. So listen carefully and you'll, you'll get it anyway. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Course description. This course involves a careful examination of apologetics as a means of defending the Christian faith in an ever-increasing hostile environment. Let me just stop and ask, does anybody agree with that statement? That it's an ever-increasing hostile environment. Okay. The emphases are on development of basic skills and understanding the issues and effectively communicating this understanding to others. This course is not a comprehensive study of apologetics, but it's more than just an overview. The organization, as I said before, it's primarily a lecture course with ample opportunity for questions. There will be handouts and notes for students as well as PowerPoint presentations. Course objectives. To introduce students to the need for conversational apologetics. To introduce the students to different styles of apologetics. To instill in the students a hunger to go deeper into the word of apologetics on their own and to introduce the students to a vast resources available in the study of apologetics. Course topics. The course will cover the following topics. Introduction to apologetics, reason for apologetics, authenticity of the Bible, design versus chance, science versus scripture, evidence of cosmology, evidence of physics, evidence of astronomy, evidence of biochemistry, evidence of biological information, Metaphysics, existentialism, new age, and world religions. So that's where we're going. Till sometime in 2024, probably. <clears throat> See if I can make this work. We have a uh, device called the Pro Presenter, so I can do all this like this, but I forgot to grab it this morning. So, oh, Kathy, do you remember how we got this up the other day? I mean, it's on here. Yeah. Um, the TV's not on. It was. Did it go off by itself? I don't know. It had a timer. Oh, it did? <clears throat> okay. All right, back on. Back on back on. Okay. But I still need you to start the PowerPoint. Cuz I don't That's my car by the way, y'all, right there. I don't want to stay. Used to be my truck, but my son has that now. Wow. <laughs> okay. Come on, cursor. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Can't find the mouse? No, the cursor's on the TV. Oh, the cursor's on the TV. There, she found it. Right there. Yay! I don't need this much today. I'm actually only going to do two slides on this today, and both of them are right toward the front. Anybody recognize this? Yes. What is it? A scale. Scale. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's a scale of any kind for balance, okay? Commonly used throughout history. In John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. And now nah, I need to stop for a minute. My passion is the Word of God. I love apologetics, but apologetics is, is just a way to effectively communicate the Word of God. It's all about the Word of God. The psalmist says, for he has exalted his word even above his name. It was so important, the concept is so important to God that they named Jesus the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. I told you, some of you didn't see that, but in, in the little promotional videos we did, I made the statement, so I'm going to give you a little teaser. And Jan's going to start getting nervous about now. <clears throat> but I said, I'm going to give you a little teaser. I'm going to tell you things that you've not heard before. I'm fairly confident of that, that over the next, over the next period of time we're doing this, I'm going to tell you things that you've never heard before. 
But it's not heresy. I promise you. And you have every right and opportunity to challenge me. One of my basic driving statements in life is if I can get you into the Word of God for no other reason than to try and prove me wrong, then I have been eminently successful because I got you in the Word. Can I get a witness? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Supposed to be teaching, not preaching. Nothing more important than the Word. You'll be okay. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I have no idea what that I am now. <laughs> Let me tell you something about the word that you have probably never heard anybody say before, especially not in a Christian context or a teaching or preaching context. Not everything in the Bible is true. It's not. It's an accurate. Whatever you read will be an accurate representation of what was happening at the time, but not everything in the Bible is true. I'm going to give you a couple examples, then I'm moving on because that's not the subject for today. In Job chapter 1, you all familiar with the story of Job? Satan appears, God says, where you been? He said, roaming to and fro across the earth. He said, have you considered my servant Job? He's perfect in every way, he loves God, hates evil. And he goes, well, of course he does. Look at the way you protect him, you guard him. He said, but if you'll take your hand away from him. And God says, okay, I will, but you can't kill him. And so he makes Job's life hell on earth. Makes an absolute mess out of it. And when all this is said and done, when it comes to the end of all the testing and stuff, before Job has his encounter with his three friends, you want to get rid of that thing? Thank you when he has his encounter with his, before he has his encounter with his friends, we read the statement in Job chapter 1 that in all this, God didn't, uh, Job did not charge God foolishly. And he made the statement, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But I've got a question for you. Who took his stuff away? The devil. The devil. Who brought the sickness on him? The devil. The devil. Here's the deal. The Old Testament believers had no concept of a bad devil and a good God. They, that was nothing that was in their understanding. It did not come from the Torah or the Quran. None of that. They did not understand that concept of bad devil versus good God. They thought everything came from the hand of God. So it made perfect sense for Job when he got to the end of this thing to make this statement. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But the Lord didn't take it away. That was an accurate statement by Job based on what he was feeling, but it's not a true statement. Jesus established the principle for us when he said, the Satan comes to the steal, kill, and destroy. So if it has lost death or destruction, it's the, it's the hand of Satan, not the hand of God. Ever. Ever. John chapter 7. Have we got a Bible handy? Or a phone or whatever. John chapter 7 verse 52. Whoever gets to it first, read that for me. Is anybody moving? Okay. Read loudly. They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find the, that a prophet did not come out of Galilee. Okay, this is one of the Pharisees. These are the leaders of the religious people of their time. He said, look into it yourself. You're from Galilee. Look into it and you'll discover that no prophet comes from Galilee. And so when I read that, I think my question is, are they being willfully stupid? They have to know the history of the Jewish nation. They have to know the history of the prophets. These guys quote the Old Testament prophets all the time. And for them to make a statement like that, look into it yourself, because no prophet comes from, from Galilee. Well, let's see. Um, Jonah was from Galilee. Micah was from Galilee. Nahum was, Hosea was, Elijah was from Galilee. Elisha was from Galilee. They had to have known that. They had to have known that. So we read that, and we think that because it's recorded in the Word of God, that it has to be true. It's not true. 
It was a statement, an intentional statement of misrepresentation on the part of the Pharisees. Yeah. So once again, my objective is to get you into the Word. <laughs> this is a wonderful book. It is an exciting book. I have been reading this book for five years now. And... Uh, <laughs> yeah, a long time. A number of years ago, I felt like the Holy Spirit was challenging me to read it through in a month. And because I was retired, the first time I retired, I've been tired a lot of times. I retire and retire and retire. retire. But I, took the, I decided to take up the challenge to read it cover to cover. I actually did it in 28 days. From the first word in Genesis to the last book in Revelation. And the thing that's so fascinating about that book is as many years as I've been reading it and as, and as reading it straight through, I keep seeing stuff. I go, that wasn't in there last time I read that. Somebody's changing the words in my Bible when I'm not looking. Cause that, that was, and there are also times when I think about my own theology and I read the Bible and go, okay, the Bible doesn't really say that, does it? <laughs> <laughs> read the book there's nothing better on TV I guarantee you Amen. there's nothing better for you to read or watch or anything else and now we have every opportunity in the world you know we got 24 different versions on my phone what I I went and picked up my grand you know I, most a lot of you know I went last week and took three of my grandsons to a baseball game well it was the A's but I guess that's as close as you can get to And then I picked my granddaughter, dropped them off and picked two of my granddaughters up and brought them back home so they could spend a weekend with Grandma Jan. And the two girls in the back, in the back seat, nah, 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 nah. I have a Bluetooth. You guys see it most of the time I wear Bluetooth. I just turned the Bible on and had it read the New Testament to me while I was driving down the road. It's great. Whether you get it this way or this way or both, read the book. So in John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. He says in, four, in verse 23, he says, But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is looking for those who will worship Him in that way. And I'm going to take just a second to do a little side note here. We've heard different accounts of the woman at the well. You know, the traditional belief is that she was not a nice woman and had all these men in her life and the ones she's living with now. And, and I've also heard people say that, well, no, under the old system, she just killed off a bunch of them. I'm thinking she's not very nice there either. If, she's all, these, if all these husbands are dying, then what's, what's wrong with that, you know? And I know what position I take, but I'm not going to tell you because it's not important. If we look at that story and what we get out of it is whether or not she was a woman of ill repute or if she had a whole bunch of husbands that were all dying, we've missed the point entirely of the story. Jesus was modeling what he always did, and that's radical inclusivity. Radical inclusivity. He said, I want everybody in the kingdom. Whosoever will may come. It's not, it's not the Father's pleasure that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But in this story, this woman comes face to face with the Messiah. And he makes this statement. Time is coming. Matter of fact, it's here now when those who worship the Father must worship in spirit and truth. For the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. The point of this slide is we need to have the balance of spirit and truth. Yes. If you have just the truth, which is the word of God... If that's all you have in your life, then you end up with a dead, cold, dry orthodoxy. Yes. But if all you have is the Spirit, you end up with silly fanaticism. Yes. You have to have both. You have to have both. And under the subject of fools rush in where angels fear to tread, most Pentecostal churches are good at the Spirit and not at the Word. C. 
Sila. I'm going to let that go before Jan unplugs me. Next, next time I'll have my pro presenter. You guys know this fellow? <laughs> Revelation 19 verse 10 says, I fell, at his, fell down at his feet to worship him. And he said, don't worship me. I'm a servant of God just like you and your brothers. Testify about the faith in Jesus. Worship God. For the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. Whenever we come, to, come together, whether it's on Sunday morning or in this, or for just together with family and friends, it's about Him. It's about Him. And it's, and it's amazing to me how easily we lose track of that. It's about Him. Now, we're studying a course of apologetics that's going to cover a lot of amazing things, but let me stop right here and tell you one of my favorite declarations to make is a person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an argument. No matter how well you know apologetics or how, um, how much maybe you don't know, if you know Him, you're above everybody else. person with an experience, that's... You personally knowing Jesus, never at the mercy of a person with an argument. It's all about Him and knowing Him. So what is apologetics? Come on, you said it on our, our promotional video the other day. Give us the verse. Uh, let's see. Put Him on the spot. <laughs> it's a defense of the faith. Okay, what's the verse we use with it all the time? First Peter 3.15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks of the hope that lies within you. The word apologetics is, a, is an English word made out of a Greek word. The Greek word is apologia. And it simply means to answer back. To give an answer back. Here's the deal. If nobody's asking you, maybe you need to take a look at your life and find out why. It says, be ready to give an answer back to anyone that asks of the hope that lies within you. So if people don't see anything different about you than they do themselves and all their friends around them, maybe something's out of balance in your life because they should be asking you. They should be talking to you. And this is not about shoving church or God down somebody's throat. My day starts typically with me sitting down at Steady Eddie's Coffee Shop just visiting with people. And it's amazing how often when something comes up, they come looking for me. Mm. You know, I had, I, had, I had one of the workers there come up and tell me about something that's going on where she goes, you're a man of God, what's happening? <laughs> oh, that's good. Be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. In your heart, set Christ apart as holy and acknowledge Him as Lord. Always be ready to give a logical, logical defense to anyone who asks. Acts 22, 1, Paul says, Brothers and esteemed fathers, listen to me as I offer my defense. 1 Corinthians 9, 3, this is my defense who would examine me to give an answer to make a defense. For what purpose? Why are we doing this? Salvation. Gospel, preaching the gospel. Yep. Salvation message. That's it. We want to win converts, not arguments. Not interested in winning arguments. There's an old saying, a man convinced against his will will be of the same opinion still. Not interested in winning arguments. We want to win people to Jesus. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The New Living says it like this, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You notice that it said, by the renewal of your mind, not the removal of your mind. <laughs> there are those out in the world that think we've lost our minds. Yeah. It's not the removal of your mind, it's the renewal of your mind. Josh McDowell, somebody you're going to meet later, mm -hmm. wrote a book called Don't Check Your Brains at the Door. Mm -hmm. I get the idea sometimes that in today's church we think that thinking is a bad thing. 
Thinking's not the problem. Bad thinking is the problem. Wrong thinking is the problem. Jesus repeatedly asked the question, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. And Webster says, Reason is to talk with one another to cause a change of mind. A lot of the translations in that passage say, Let's argue this thing out. Let's argue this thing out. The rest of that verse that he quoted is, With meekness and fear. With meekness and fear. You're not, bull you're not being a bully. You're not going in as a bull in a china closet. You just want to have answers that you can peacefully give to your friends that need to know Jesus. So, okay, it's time to put your thinking caps on. Is that going to go away when I shut that? Yep. During this study, we will talk about philosophical arguments First principles, we're going to spend some time on that because that's critically important. The Kalam cosmological argument, we're going to talk to, let me stop for just a second and say we're going to, I'm going to be quoting some really, really smart people. And like most other really, really smart people like Chris, they use big words. So when I give you one of those big words, I'm going to try and stop and explain it to you, tell you what the word means, and if I don't do it, Adequate job, just let me know. We'll go back over it, okay? And here's one of them, but we're not going to talk about it now. Epistemology. We're going to talk about physics, the ontological argument. We're going to talk about astrology, not astrology, astronomy, biology, biochemistry, and I will show you that ontogeny recapits phylogeny. We're going to discuss metaphysics, the archaeopteryx, Hegel's ideation of world, secularization, pluralism, Hackle's embryos, and Darwin's tree of life, just to name a few. Ready? This stuff can give you a mental hernia. I know what some of you are thinking. I'm in the wrong class. Can I transfer? Or I'm not coming back It's... <laughs> It's too much to learn. So what's the plan? You can't bury your heads in the sand. We can't whistle past the graveyard. Peter's instructions were to all of us. To all of us. Be ready to give an answer. So I have a solution. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 12 through 18 is what it says. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body, so it is with Christ. Some of you are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit. We all share the same spirit. The body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, it does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would you, how would you hear if your whole body were near, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where He wants it. So I have a question for you. What do you do for a living? I'm retired. What did you do for a living? I was a salesperson. Okay, salesperson. What did you do for a living? I'm a deputy clerk. Deputy clerk? You in the blue jacket. What do you do for a living? He's a doctor. Yeah. What do you do? Pick one. When I figure it out, I'll let you know. Pick one of them. <laughs> Construction. Construction. He's also a beekeeper. Yeah. What do you do? I um, manage a business. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Architect. Architect. Mm. What do you do? I'm a consultant. Consultant? Okay. I'm a master herbalist. Master herbalist. So, here's my question for you. If I... I'm getting ready to go into surgery and I want to make sure that I am thoroughly under. Am I going to call a business consultant? How about a beekeeper? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. I'm going to call this guy right here, right? Yeah. And what about if, if I need a building designed for me. Am I going to call him? No. I'm going to call him. 
because he's an architect, right? If I want to know how to mix music and get the right sound, am I going to call her? No, I'm calling Al. That's the point of all this. God put the body together according as it has pleased him. We work together. If we were all the same, just the example Paul gives here in 1 Corinthians about, about the physical body. If everybody were an eye, we just big old eyeballs sitting around the room, right? Because you can't well, go anywhere because there's no feet or nothing. It takes all the members working together. So that's my solution to how we can do this without knowing all this stuff. I'm going to give you some highlights on some of this stuff. And I'm going to equip you so you won't have to back down from anybody. And along the way, I'm going to introduce you to 18 absolute brainiac experts in these different fields and show you how to use them as your resources. You don't have to fully understand the Cambrian explosion. Anybody know what that is? Okay, you're going to learn. But you don't have to fully understand that if you know somebody that does. Right? Do, let, me, let me ask you a, a trick question. Do, do you or do we, and, and this is, there's no wrong answer here, well maybe, but do you believe in the Big Bang Theory? No. I believe it exists. I do. I believe God said it and bang, it happened. We're going to talk about that in one of these upcoming times, too, and it's going to warp your brain. The most liberating day of my life is when I discovered it was okay to say, I don't know. Yeah. But then follow it up with, but I'll find out. Okay. Um, sadly for me, most of my adult life, I, I thought I always had to have the answer. And the, the downside to that is, if that's your attitude, you start winging it. Yeah. You know, making stuff up that sounds good. Mm-hmm. But that can lead to a whole other set of problems. Oh, yeah. If I don't know, I'll tell you, I don't know. But I'll find an answer for you. And that's what we're talking about here. You can't know all this stuff and live a normal life. You just can't. There's just too much stuff unless God calls you to be an apologist, right? We're going to talk, I'm going to introduce you over the, over the next period to some absolutely amazing people, most of whom were atheists when they started out. You know, how many of you have seen Lee Strobel's A Case for Christ, the, the movie? Absolutely mind-bogglingly good. Lee Strobel... At least oh, I had met him a number of years ago back in Chicago. He was part of a church back there that I, where I went for conference. And uh, he was a journalist. He was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And his wife got saved. <laughs> it ruined his life. It absolutely ruined his life because he was a card-carrying atheist. And... He, from that experience, one of my favorite lines you will hear me say over and over again is follow the evidence wherever it leads. Follow the evidence wherever it leads. If you refuse to do that, you're a coward. Follow the evidence wherever it leads. Well, Lee's life was a mess because of his wife getting saved and he's trying to grope with all this. Now he's going to continue having a normal home life and when his wife had gone off the deep end, in his opinion. And, but one of the reporters that worked in the office with him there at the Tribune was a believer. And he finally just jumped down Lee Stody because I'm sick of this. I'm tired of hearing you whine and complain. You're a journalist. Follow the evidence where it leads. And that's his story after that. He began to investigate, Believing the best way, he and, he and Josh McDowell have this in common. They both decided the best way to prove Christianity wrong was to use their own book. So they got the Bible and started investigating the Bible and reading the Bible and studying the Bible and finding out people that knew about the Bible. 
and both of them in the same thing, same thing in different words. Josh McDowell was in the, in the library at the university to where he attended, and he rocked back in his chair and said, it's all true. It's all true. He had pushed it as far as he could to try and prove Christianity wrong, and every time he turned a corner, he ran into more evidence that it's all true. And now Josh McDowell is one of the leading apologists in the world. He wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It's about that thick. He wrote another one called New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Lee Strobel had this space in the bottom of the newspaper where he worked and he had gone down there and cleared this room out and put a big whiteboard on there and he's writing all these notes and putting tacking stuff up and all this kind of stuff and and he just every time he'd try he'd trying to go into medical journals and stuff and try to discount the crucifixion <laughs> yeah that was fun <laughs> and he ended up reading about the crucifixion what amounts to from an absolute uh, Trusted, trusted source, American Medical Journal, whatever that thing's called. And he finally backed up one day looking at his whiteboard and said, you win. You win. He was amazing, amazing man of God. But sometimes we have a hard time doing that. You guys remember the old uh, sitcom Happy Days? Remember Fonzie? Mm -hmm. I was kind of like Fonzie. He couldn't say the word wrong. He, he, had, he had messed up on something. They were trying to get him to admit it. He goes, I was... Rrr. I was... Rrr. Finally pointed to Potsy. He said, Potsy, he goes, wrong. He goes, yeah, that. <laughs> when your whole life has been going in one direction, all of a sudden you find out that it's been going in the wrong direction. The good news, God allows you turns. I have a plaque in my office that says, I'm not sure I understand all I know about this. You're going to know some stuff you're not going to understand. But it's going to be a fun, fun journey. Steve Brown from Emory, Emory University says, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly until you can learn to do it well. Get in the Word. Get in the Word. Get in the Word. You're never too young to start. You're never too old. Whatever, anything that's worth doing is worth doing poorly until you learn to do it well. We have a tendency, it's our human nature, we want to be right. I mean, I want to be right. I hate it when I'm wrong. So we have a tendency, as our human nature, to not dare, to not step out, to not take a chance just in case I'm not right. And his statement to us is, anything worth doing, which obviously what we're doing is worth doing, is worth doing poorly until you can learn to do it well. Now, if you couple that statement with the one I gave you early on, that person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an argument. Do not be afraid to talk to your friends, talk to your family with meekness. Your goal is to win them to Jesus, not to win an argument. Keep be humble in it. But, you know, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 that the goal of every Christ follower is to be conformed to the image of Jesus, right? And he's not talking about your physiognomy. He's not talking about that someday you'll, you'll look at that picture and go, oh, that's Chris, you know, or Chris. <laughs> he's talking about on the inside. So if you want to be conformed to the image of Jesus, not worrying about what you look like, if you want to be conformed to the image of Jesus, find out what he did and do it. Find out what was important to him and emulate that. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. Well, what should our goal be then? 
What's that? Yes. Yeah. If his goal was to seek and to save that which is lost, then our goal should be to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus said, I have come to destroy the works of the devil. So what would, should we be doing? Destroy the works of the devil. Yeah, pursuing the ability to destroy the works of the devil. We don't run from him. <laughs> my Bible says, you guys might have a different version, but my Bible says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Yep. I'm not asking you to be foolish, but I'm asking you to be brave. Don't run from the devil. You're greater than he is because the Holy Spirit resides in you. Take a stand. There are times when, when he and I go toe to toe. And I tell him exactly what I think of him. And I'm not afraid to do it. Because I know that the one that dwells inside me is greater than he is. Never get confused and think that Satan is God's counterpart. It's not. Satan's a created being just like all the rest of them. Only God is eternally existent. And Satan doesn't like him. You know the fastest way to get to me if you don't like me? Protect my kids. You'll incur my wrath faster by attacking my kids than you will by attacking me. Well, you're his kids. And he loves you so much. And Satan knows that. And he knows that the, the best way for him to hurt the father is to hurt you. So he's going to come after you. Scripture says he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But the good news for you, if you're a believer, if you're walking with the Holy Spirit inside you, he just makes a lot of noise because he doesn't have any teeth left. He roars a lot. He's a roaring lion, but he's devoid of his power in your life. Unless you yield it to him. Unless you yield it to him. I read the end of the book. We win. We win. You know, the world is a nutty place right now. Gas is however much it is. To the best of our understanding, people are intentionally destroying chicken farms so it will artificially raise the price of chickens and eggs. Farmers are being paid more to till their crops back into the soil than they make by selling them. And since everything is driven by greed, the world's nuts. There is only one answer. His picture was just up there a minute ago. I had, a, I had the opportunity. I was sitting down at Steady Eddie's and some discussion came up about the foolishness that's going on in the world and, you know, and the shooting at the school in Uvalde, Texas. Somebody said, what's the answer? I said, you asking me? You don't want my answer. The answer is Jesus, but you don't want to hear that. Well, too bad you already heard it. You can't. I said it, you can't unhear it. Right? But he's the answer. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Yep. Be ready to give an answer. Because they're going to ask you. If, you're, if your life is... If your life 
is set to bring glory and honor to Jesus, they're going to ask you. Yeah. They will. may not happen every day, and it may not happen in the way you think it's going to. But listen. The Holy Spirit will speak. He's always speaking. The problem is we're usually not listening. may not be this way in your life, but there are times when I just feel like the Holy Spirit's going, Hey! 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 He's always speaking. Listen. And when he tells you to do something, I'm sure I'm the only one in here that's ever had to deal with this. But I've driven around the block more times because I didn't go see the person the very first time the Holy Spirit told me to. And I'm not getting away with it. And by now you would think I would know I'm not getting away with it. You know, just the Holy Spirit says, you need to talk to that person. Well, you know, I will next time I get an opportunity. When your car turns right, go around the block. You have an opportunity. Go talk to them. Go talk to them. Go talk to them. Be ready to give an answer. And it's the simplest thing. You know what? <clears throat> I have discovered that you can absolutely make a person's day and open up doors of opportunity to witness by buying somebody a soda. I'm serious. I go to Dollar General to pick up my decaf coffee pods and there'll be somebody in there, you know, with a loaf of bread or a can of soda or something. I say, let me get that for you. Well, you don't have to do that. I say, I know. That's what makes it fun because I don't have to. And they just are so blown away by a simple act of generosity. You know, anything you have come from God anyway. We are blessed to bless. And all of it, all of it is to set up the opportunities that 1 Peter 3.15 is addressing. Be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. Amen? Perfect. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Turn me off. I'm done. <laughs> so... Oh, thanks. <laughs>